Hello everyone. I am so excited today because I finally get to take a break from solving leak code problems and do something that I find actually more interesting, system design. Yes, we're finally getting back into it. And today I actually have a very special announcement. This here that I've been working on, this is a little write up with some images and a lot more is actually a part of my new newsletter, which is completely free. You can sign up for it on neatcode.io slash newsletter link will be below covers coding interview prep system design career advice tech news and a lot more if you sign up you'll get access to a 500 page system design pdf and pretty soon i will be creating a pdf with a bunch of algorithm animations and lessons and things like that it's going to be completely free and if you're a subscriber to the newsletter you will get that so the quick agenda for today i know this is light theme don't worry i'm not just going to be going through this and reading it to you that would be too boring we're going to be doing something even more interesting we're going to cover all of this which is how notion is using sqlite for caching if you know me you know my style is very hands-on i like to draw that's what we're going to do we're going to go through kind of the background talk a little bit about what SQLite is, how it's used in the browser, how Notion uses it, a little bit about web workers. We're going to be doing some coding for that and a few more diagrams. And we're really going to be digging into the details. If you're the type of person who just likes to hear a bunch of keywords, sharding, caching, all that stuff, that's cool. But to me, that's boring. I want to know the details, what's actually going on. That's what I'm going to go over. So the first thing I want to do is just go over a little bit of the background about Notion and do a little bit of dev tooling. So this is the Notion UI. It's a website. It's kind of a productivity tool, also very similar to Google Docs in that like there's a bunch of documents. So now let's take a look at the dev tools. I'm specifically going to go over here to the application tab and then I'm going to go to storage here. You can see right now Notion is using seven megabytes. I mean, I just created this brand new account. So seven megabytes isn't a ton. It's probably a bunch of like metadata and a few of these pages that are created by default. And so watch what happens though. When I take all this text here and I just copy and paste it into the same document a bunch, watch what happens. Do you notice the storage on the right side? It seems to be increasing. And so now when we refresh, the data that we stored is persisted. All of this data is cached locally to our file system. This is not something that's built out of the box. This is something that has to be coded manually. And that's exactly what Notion did. That's what we're going to be talking about. Now, we'll be talking about this more in depth, but I want to quickly say Notion is using SQLite for caching locally to the file system. Now, an alternative could have been local storage, right? It's definitely using local storage for certain things here, you can see. But why would it be a bad idea to cache like the document data itself? Well, let me show you. This is my personal Notion account, and you can see that I'm not even like a big Notion user, but it's using 4,000 megabytes. That's four gigabytes. Storing all of that within local storage is not really feasible. That's not what local storage is for. And not only that, but writing to local storage is not as efficient as doing it via SQLite. And we'll talk about exactly why. So first, Notion's objective here was to implement caching in the browser. This would result in faster page loads as well as navigating between pages. Why exactly is that? Well, the alternative to reading from the local cache, which by the way, this is a disk based cache. Cache is a very loose word, but it's generally faster to read from disk than it is to make a network request, which is what the case would be if we were going and reading from Notion's backend for like every single page. And so Notion was successful in doing this. They did reduce latency by, I think, about 20%. And here's how they did it. Well, I think it's worth covering what exactly SQLite is because it's definitely different than a traditional relational database like Postgres or MySQL and even NoSQL databases like MongoDB. The traditional setup is typically a client server setup where you have a server that's running some application code, for example, Python or something else. And then that code will read and write from a database that's typically hosted on a separate server nowadays, but you technically could have that database running on the same server. And then those two processes, those separate processes could still communicate uh, via some protocol. And remember that a process is an operating system unit. Your operating system is managing that process. Every process has its own memory and it could be made up of multiple threads. 
Now, SQLite is actually very different. Kind of like the name implies, it's light. It does not require a separate server. Not only that, you generally can't run it on a separate server. It runs alongside your application code via a single process, one process for the database and the application code. Now, SQLite still has actually a lot of support for database indexes like SQL support, queries, tables, a lot of functionality, probably not as much as Postgres, like it does not have the feature parity of Postgres for sure, but it has a lot of the functionality, but it has a lot of limitations. As you can kind of tell, I mean, if the code and the database are running on the same process, the obvious limitation is that the data can only be stored locally. So if this code is running on a user's machine, maybe their phone, their browser, well, it's going to store the data in the same place. It's not going to persist that data to Notion's servers. And of course, in Notion's case, this is all happening within the browser. You pretty much just install SQLite as a dependency, as if it's a library, like a Node.js dependency, a Python dependency, etc. In terms of the use cases of SQLite, one, we kind of mentioned the browser. So it's definitely used for web development. But since that data is stored locally, it's generally used as a cache because, of course, if the user like clears their cache, clears like the data in their browser, all that's going to be lost. Or maybe if they switch to a different machine, all their data is going to be lost. And that's perfectly fine if that same data is also stored within Notion servers. Now, a couple other use cases you can read a bit more about in the newsletter itself is embedded systems, also desktop and mobile applications. Now, we know that generally in the browser, the code that you can run is very limited, and that's intentional, like for security reasons. Generally, you can run JavaScript, and even that will have limitations on what it can do to like the operating system. Yes, it can write data to disk, but it's limited in how it can do that and the APIs that it can use to do that. You wouldn't want somebody's JavaScript code to write a bunch of bugs and malware and things like that to your computer. But browsers also have the ability to take some code that's actually things like C, C++, Java, languages that are not JavaScript. And then this can be compiled on a server, like this, a server that's separate from the web browser. It can be compiled into a language called WebAssembly or this for short. And then a browser can actually run this code. So in a sense, browsers actually can run these sorts of languages. And the reason that this is important is because that's exactly why they can use something like SQLite within the browser. They're using a WebAssembly version of SQLite. And we know that it has to be able to write to the file system, and it's going to be able to do that, something called the file system API, specifically the origin private file system. You can read more about these in the newsletter. This itself is not enough. Remember, we talked about local storage. How does that compare to SQLite? Well, first of all, local storage is very limited in the data it can store, for example, megabytes of data. But as you saw in my case, I have four gigabytes stored in Notions. Local storage is not going to be enough for that. So SQLite will allow us to store additional data than local storage. That's one. That alone, by the way, is a big enough reason to use SQLite. But if that's not enough to convince you, let me tell you something else. We know that in the browser, JavaScript is generally single threaded. There's the main thread. And so if we are writing to disk via local storage API, if we're writing to local storage, that actually is not asynchronous. It's a blocking IO call. So it's not asynchronous. It's blocking, meaning our main thread is going to wait for that to complete before going back to the JavaScript, like the main code that we were writing and uh, executing. And all of this has to happen within a single thread. But the benefit of SQLite is we can actually run this in a separate thread. And of course, that would be great for performance reasons. It'll be faster to do this and it will be asynchronous. All of this is accomplished with something that I'm going to go over now called web workers. So I'm going to take a couple seconds to draw this a little bit visually, and then we're actually going to get into the code. I really want you to understand what web workers are doing. Imagine you have a main thread, like the JavaScript main thread. We can also spin up a new web worker, which will actually run JavaScript code 
within a separate thread. And within that web worker, you can imagine what we're going to do. That's where we're going to run the SQL Alight operations. We can use this to write to our file system. And this can probably be done in parallel as the main thread is running. The reason it's important to do this is because this is very computationally intensive. It's going to possibly be reading lots of data and writing lots of data. Doing all this in a separate thread is very important. You might think, well, couldn't you have done the same thing with local storage? Well, I mean, even if it weren't for the data limitations, I don't believe local storage can actually use the web worker API, at least not directly. I think it might be able to send data to the main thread if it needed to, and then the main thread would be able to write to local storage. But obviously, then there would be no benefit of doing this in the first place. So now let me actually show you a bit about how you can actually code up a web worker. It's not as complicated as you think. And when you actually look at the code, that's when you'll be able to remember this stuff in the future. So I have a very small example I want to show you. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. So I have my index.html. I just have one script linked to this. That's my main dot js and within here i'm going to copy and paste a little bit of code so here we are creating a new web worker we're using the web worker api and we're passing in the path of a file notice how that's the same as the file up above remember these are separate threads if you remember operating systems and parallel programming you know that threads have to communicate with each other they don't necessarily share the same memory and same variables and all that so communication is kind of done via this API. You can see worker.post message. We're sending this data. It's in the form of a string, but it didn't necessarily have to be that. Look, you can see that the type would be any. We could have passed in an object or more data if we wanted to. And this is how we send data to the worker. We can also listen for messages and then execute some callback. For example, in this case, a worker dot on message. Whenever we receive a message, just take the data of that message and just console dot log it. Pretty simple, right? Now, in terms of the worker itself, it's even more simple. All it does is listen for data from the main thread. Whenever it receives that, it'll take the data and then just console dot log it. This is the data we received from within the worker. And then we're going to send data back to the main thread just with post message. So uh, you can see the self keyword here is kind of the distinction between that and here. Here we're using worker.post message on message. Here we're doing self.on message post message. By the way, if you're a beginner, a friendly tip would be don't try to memorize all this. I don't memorize it. It's not really worth memorizing. You can just Google it or nowadays chat GPT it. At least now you know that this is possible. You have this as a part of your toolkit. At least try to understand the high level. Hopefully this code looks pretty reasonable to you. An even better tip would be to code all of this yourself. Try it out, run it locally, which is exactly what I'm going to do now. I'm actually going to run this server now and show you what it's going to be doing. What would you expect it to do? Well, it's going to execute this script and execute this script. So in theory, it should console.log log a few things. So let's run the server. I'm going to do that in VS Code using the live server extension. I opened up the page on localhost 5500. Let's take a look at the console tab. And here you can see that this line received in the worker, hello from main script. You can see that this is logged from within the a worker. So this line executed first because main.js was the one that initiated all of this. You can see within main.js, we sent the message to the worker this message, and then the worker logs that message. Then the worker sends data back to the main thread, and then we log what we received from them. That's why the second line is hello from worker. That's the data that the worker sent. Pretty simple, but this is what Notion used to implement caching efficiently. Now, imagine that you're Notion. You spent all this time trying to improve performance, and you actually did, so it's like about 20% better for most users. But what if for a small percentage of users, let's say like 5% of users, people that are on really old devices, like maybe a really old Android phone, and they're running like the Notion Android app, or even using it within their browser or something. Imagine that for some of those users, it's actually slower to read from disk than it is to just make a network request to Notion's backend. Maybe they have a really, really good, efficient backend, and you have a really, really bad phone, bad hardware, really slow file system, maybe a crappy CPU, single-threaded, so the web worker doesn't even do anything, at least in terms of like performance improvements. You tell me, in this scenario, what would you do?
it only applies to a small percentage of users. Well, I guess I kind of spoiled it for you by having the correct answer right in front of you. You would race the two requests. So at least that's what Notion did. And it turned out to be a pretty a smart solution because think about it. The Notion Android app starts. You make two requests at the same time. You read from the file system and you call Notion's backend. Whichever one of these requests finishes first is going to be the one that you get the data from. So for example, like for 5% of people, this one will be faster, but for 95% of people, the cache, the local file system will be faster. The fact that we have multiple requests going, maybe the cache is actually out of date and the backend has newer, fresher data. I think that could also be a potential benefit. Maybe this architecture is used for more than just the Android app. Pretty smart, pretty clever, and a very, very simple, elegant solution, in my opinion. Now, latency is bad, but you want to know what's even worse? Data corruption. That's the more serious issue that Notion was actually encountering. Imagine that a user has Notion open in multiple tabs. They just opened like three different tabs. Each of those tabs is potentially going to fetch fresh data from the server and maybe cache it to the local file system via the web worker. And you might have multiple web workers doing that concurrently at the same time. Well, can you believe that this actually resulted in data corruption? And the fix is relatively simple, so I'll go over that quickly. We could have a shared web worker, which is implemented slightly differently in terms of code than the web worker code that I showed you, but it is like pretty similar. And what happened is we load, let's say, multiple browser tabs. Each of them needs to write data to the SQLite cache. And instead of each of them directly sending it to its own web worker, we do something different. We send all of them to the shared web worker and the shared web worker will direct it to a single web worker, which is going to be the active tab. And that is going to write to the SQLite cache. And this way we guarantee only one process is doing this at a time. And it makes sense because only one tab can generally be active at a time. I mean, you might have multiple windows open on multiple monitors even, but even in that case, isn't it true that you can only select one tab at a time? You can only be like truly active in one tab at a time. This basically helped to mitigate the data corruption. But do you smell that? <laughs> I heard that SQLite is actually ACID compliant. It is. And more specifically, we focus on the I. Remember that it stands for isolation. If you don't know this, by the way, I cover all of this in my System Design for Beginners course. I just don't have time in this video to explain every little thing. But isolation in general should mean that multiple concurrent writes will not interfere with each other and they definitely shouldn't result in data corruption. So it seems like there's a contradiction. Why is that? Well, it wasn't SQLite's fault, actually. According to Notion, it was actually a result of the browser's OPFS API, which is the one that's actually responsible for uh, the read and write. That was the part that wasn't handling the concurrency. That was resulting in concurrency issues and data corruption. And this is exactly the kind of detail I think a lot of people gloss over, but I thought it was worth mentioning. I think I'm gonna go ahead and leave things there, but if you prefer the full written version, definitely check out the Neat Code newsletter, completely free. And please, please, please give me your feedback on this video. Did you like the pictures or do you not like them? They take a lot of time to make, and if you guys don't care for them, then I can probably save time by not adding them, but I think visuals go a long way to really explain what's going on, not just for data structures, but also system design, of course. Let me know what you think about the length of this video. I like to keep them around like 20 minutes long so that we have enough time to actually go into details, but I don't want it to be like an hour long video. But if you guys prefer that, I'm happy to do that. Just let me know. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.